Hi, Professor Lynn. Thank you so much for your great talk today. So I probably want to ask you a couple of questions. One of them, you talked about creating an atlas with the data of this amazing new technique of looking at what a myelin fraction. And I was wondering whether you can tell us a little bit about what would this database that contained the atlas be used for? Will it be probably something we may be able in the future to use it to come back as a standard and be able to measure different maybe population to see if we're seeing the same sort of development? Right, so, so the atlases that we created um, have several different ways. One, you can create atlases based on structural images. You can create atlases based on diffusion tensor imaging. So structural imaging gives us the insights into different structures. And so that information would be critically important to identify if a child in the future is deviating from the standard atlases. So that would be something that we can do right away. The other thing is also the atlases also gives us a, a tool to potentially extract different information at different brain regions. Because you can imagine that if you are interested in identifying how the medial prefrontal cortex area changes as a function of age, um, the most perhaps uh, uh, rigorous way is to go in and draw that region every single slice on every single subject. But obviously it's very prone to interrate variability. It takes tremendous, tremendous amount of time. But Atlas allows us to actually map the regions onto the individual subject right away mm -hmm. and extract the information right away. Mm -hmm. So it improves our ability to do a larger sample studies. At the same time, also allows us to look at different variability across population. That's the reason why that we establish atlases for structural or for DTI or even for brain functions. So there are many different atlases depend on which parameters that you wanted to assess. Okay. I mean, that's great. I mean, I guess when we think about brain development, we're thinking about the expansion or the change in increase in size. But in reality, we know there are aspects of reducing things like synapses. So these are also things that you will be able to tease out, and those will be the data to show the changes from being large to being small based on what's happening in the brain. Absolutely. So in fact, actually our data are already showing that, for example, in the primary visual cortex area, it increases in volume up to about nine months old. Okay. And the, the visual, primary visual cortex area actually start to decrease in volume. Okay. And this would be a good indication of the pruning process. Okay. Right, so in fact, actually based on postmortem studies, I've shown that visual cortex, the the brain region that actually start to prune in the earliest. And similar to our result, actually we show that the pruning actually occur very, very early compared to the rest of the brain. Um, we also be able to assess the pruning processes in the Wernicke area and Broca's area, okay. um, which is associated with language functions. And those are occur later, about 18 months old, it starts to show in the decrease in volumes. So again, going back to the atlas issues in a way that once we have this atlas, it allows us to really extract different parameters at different time in an automated fashion. And so it, it took away the needs of uh, interrater to try to draw the region at the same time also allow us to really address fundamental question in a much more efficient way. Okay, and I think one of the aha moment for me was when you talk about the higher order mm. of development because mm. With literature, we used to think that that doesn't really happen until later in life. Mm -hmm. But it seems like with this new technique, you're really able to show that it actually happens early in life, yeah, rather I, than what we thought. Yeah, this is a, this is interesting because I think, you know, we always when I was a graduate student, I, I've been taught this mm -hmm. is the case. Yeah. But when my son was born, you know, it, it surprises me that. I don't think those are basic brain function. I think that some of the uh, skill that he had, not because he's smart, but I think that <laughs> it's just that naturally they know how to manipulate their parents in terms of to get what they want. Mm -hmm. And their memory function actually developed very, very early on. And memory is the cornerstone of high order brain functions, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so I think actually it happens or emerged really early. It just simply because the tools that we had previously to assess high order brain function is simply not sensitive enough. But with an imaging 
approaches, it, it offers this potential opportunity to really quantify and assess the higher order branch functional networks such as dorsal attention network, executive control network, deformal networks. Those networks are critically important for higher order brain functional activities. And we can now quantify how it starts and how it continues to evolve and how it becomes matured uh, using an uh, imaging approach which I think is more quantitative and more objective. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, it, I won't be a nutrition if I don't put in the nutrition question in there. So in one of your studies, you're going to be looking at dietary intake, you're going to be looking at breastfeeding, you're going to be looking at the diet. And I'm just wondering that if you can tell us a little bit on how do you see that you'll be able to tease out based on those data from nutrition to kind of overlay on the imaging data to be able to potentially actually identify what possible nutrients or nutrients interaction and dosage that may be able to impact this dif different area of development. Yeah, this is certainly one of the major focuses uh, of this mm -hmm. study that we are currently working on to to collect the information, including feeding practices, uh, breast milk samples, uh, mm -hmm. cognitive assessment, brain imaging, mm -hmm. and more importantly, this is a study uh, that designed for longitudinal study. And so based on the trajectories of the brain growth trajectory using MR, providing different functional parameters, at the same time, the trajectories of different nutrients, mm -hmm. um, different um, microbiota, in, uh, in different um, sleep quality, okay. that yeah. some of the parameters can be used as a covariate to control some of the confounds. So this is really, I think this is perhaps one of the most comprehensive studies mm -hmm. that really take into different con the, the consideration of different parameters, mm -hmm. potentially remove some of the covariates and specifically trying to address how different nutrients might have different impacts at different time window of functional development. As we know, brain function develop at different time for mm -hmm. depend on the function and they have this critical time period as well as sensitive time periods associated with each function. So the ability to do a longitudinal characterization of different brain function coupled with the nutritional index mm -hmm. would potentially allows us to hopefully tease away some of the complex interactions, how different nutrients or the combination of different set of nutrients would have major impacts on early brain functional development. Okay, I mean, say that I think most people will say, yeah, I mean, it's one thing to look at the nutrition, to look at the intake, but to be able to understand how that gets into the brain and mm -hmm. that function in the brain, is a, it's really complex when you're thinking about a human baby or human child. Are you guys thinking of doing a side preclinical probably setup where you can be able to actually tease those out from a structure point of view itself rather than, you know, association studies that we may be able to get with this type of data that you guys are using? Right, so so from an imaging point of view, that's the that's the uh, beauty about MR mm -hmm. images. It provides neuron substrates. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer just, it's no longer just based on behavioral outcomes. Mm -hmm. They actually can see different part of the brains, mm -hmm. how it changes, and different tissue contents, mm -hmm. such as mining contents, mm -hmm. such as um, uh, myelination process, it changes cortical gray matter volume, which mm -hmm. is where neuron resides, how it changes. Mm -hmm. and, and so this really provides the underpinnings of human brain development in coupling potentially different nutritional factors into it, yeah. Okay, so you'll be able to infer those changes and be able to determine what nutrients maybe impact those particular changes. That's the goal, yes, yes. absolutely, okay. that's right. the goal. Right. That's great, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you. And thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.